Until now, we have neutralized dozens of terror tunnels and we are determined to complete this mission with or without a ceasefire. Therefore, I will not agree to any offer that does not allow the Israeli Defense Force to complete this important mission for the security of the people of Israel. Israel's military saying Thursday it was calling up another 16,000 reserves, a move that will allow it to expand this operation against Hamas terrorists. New call-up orders follow some of the most intensive fighting that we have seen between Israel and Hamas since this dispute started about 27 days ago. Let's bring in Ruben Ben Shalom. He is a former Israeli Air Force pilot. You also write as a freelancer for the Jerusalem Post. Great to have you with us. Good morning from Tel Aviv. There you go. Okay, explain to me in the last couple of days what you have seen different uh, that we have uh, that we are led to believe uh, this campaign is getting uh, more harsh. Well, well first, I think the. Well, go on. If in the beginning the leadership of Israel was saying quiet will be answered with quiet. And we kept saying this all along, abiding by uh, more and more ceasefires. Now, if you listen to our prime minister, he's not talking about quiet anymore. He's talking about uh, dismantling the terror apparatus, which is Hamas, as a precondition for declaring a ceasefire. So I think that is the major change that we see now as far as policy. And again, on the ground, the IDF is working, still dismantling more and more tunnels, recruited mm -hmm. 16,000 more soldiers, which is probably to allow, to enable the decision to expand if necessary. Another U.N. school was hit yesterday. Health clinic was struck yesterday. Everyone, of course, quickly jumps to the conclusion that Israel is to blame. Uh, then when further investigation starts to come into play, uh, can you clarify some of the facts versus the fictions as to who is responsible and why so many refugee Palestinians were caught in the middle? Well, we've seen this in previous campaigns and other militaries around the world have seen this in other campaigns. For many years, uh, 2004 in Fallujah didn't look very different than this campaign looks as far as fighting terrorists in an urban environment. Of course, when something tragic like that happens, if a clinic or a school is hit, the other side will immediately claim that it was an uh, Israeli shell. The Israeli side will usually not jump and say, it wasn't us, because we have to investigate. And you know what? Sometimes it may be a shell of the IDF. Every single case is investigated. So far, most of the uh, cases that we have seen that have been investigated show that, in fact, it was ordnance fired by Hamas that actually impacted back inside the Gaza Strip. This is used mostly as a, as a propaganda campaign. As, of course, civilians are getting, getting caught in the crossfire. And I'm even guessing that investigation after the war will show that some of these ordinances were the IDF. Fighting in an urban environment is terrible. You have actual experience being involved in this kind of conflict, so I'll draw upon your experience to give us uh, some truth to the matter. 1360 uh, Palestinians have been lost in this uh, battle. 56, and I think that number's been fluctuating a little bit because reports are just coming in. Israeli soldiers, IDF members have been killed. That number doesn't get a lot of attention, but it is a very significant loss for Israel. Why? Well, I think this is the nature of a country like Israel, and I think we've all seen how we treat even one Israeli soldier abducted, giving back a thousand terrorists for him. So, yes, every single soldier is a whole world in itself and a tragedy. But you know what? At a time like this, you see the resilience of the state of Israel, understanding that we're at war, looking back at our past. Uh, we have sacrificed many soldiers throughout uh, our 66 years of existence. Um, and 56 is a large number, but if you try to look at this uh, professionally, uh, as a country fighting a very, very difficult war, again, I will go back to my experience of doing international collaboration, you see that this is what a campaign like this looks like. You lose soldiers along the way. Uh, if you look at the, at the ratio, you'll see that many, many uh, Hamas fighters are killed, many hundreds of Hamas uh, fighters are killed. Almost every confrontation on the ground ends with a victory of the IDF soldiers. And, uh, and, of course, as I said before, because of the tactics that are being used by the terrorists of working on purpose inside and embedded inside civilian population, then they are drawing the fire to, of course, increase uh, the harm inflicted on civilian population, and they tragically are succeeding in this.
Yeah, and, and the propaganda is working the headlines and the pictures of the uh, dead civilians. It, it, you know, you can't undo those kinds of images in the world as people look at this. Nonetheless, Netanyahu uh, says he will not agree to an Israeli truce until the job is done of getting rid of those tunnels, which are so, so important. So how close is Israel to getting the job done? I think we heard the leadership uh, of Israel, the political leadership yesterday, talk about days. Is days, does days mean three days or seven days? I can't tell you. But it's clear that within the next few days, we will probably be uncovering and dismantling most of the tunnels in that area that we're working on. Um, and what the Prime Minister said is very clear, that we cannot agree to a ceasefire that will just bring us into another state of calm, this illusion of calm, because we know that will lead to another confrontation in a year, as we've seen that happen in the past. So I think this is very important to be declared that we cannot agree to a ceasefire before this, this job is done. And that does not mean dismantling 100% of the tunnels, because that won't happen. That will happen only after we transition into the next phase that should be declared by the international community, which is demilitarizing Gaza, and then going section by section and actually removing all the rockets and dismantling all the tunnels. How concerned are you about some of the language we are hearing Hamas uh, trying to get Hezbollah, trying to draw them into this conflict to attack Israel on the other side? And, and hearing in the international community more and more calls for an actual full-out in, intifada. Explain the dangers of that and what kind of threat uh, we could see with that. This is an example why the leadership, the prime minister, of course, bears so much responsibility and sees such a wide picture that I don't think we... Uh, can really grasp all the responsibility that lays on his shoulders and the overall picture that, of course, some of it is intelligence that we don't all see, we're not all exposed to, and international considerations, and altogether balancing these issues. It's always a consideration when Israel fights a campaign in one front to see that the other front doesn't emerge as far as the capacity, of course, the IDF can manage a few fronts simultaneously. We have to remember that this was not declared a war, this was declared an operation, and rightfully so. The, the big IDF is now fighting uh, a pinpoint operation against a terror organization, as harsh as it may be, and the price may be very high for the IDF and, of course, tragic for the people of Gaza. Still, the scope of previous wars that we have seen, a few fronts simultaneously, is something completely different, and the IDF is always monitoring and preparing, looking very closely, especially at, uh, at the northern border of Hezbollah, and don't forget, we're looking at international players here, regional players like Iran, that may decide, they may calculate that it is wise for them at this time to start another front in order to challenge Israel. What is your biggest concern of what you're seeing there, and where do you see uh, it going? I mean, as far as seeing an end to any kind of, you know, a, a campaign? You want the truth? Yeah. My biggest concern is the people of Gaza, the poor people of Gaza, the civilians got, that got caught up in this horrific, uh, tragic uh, war imposed by Hamas. That is my great concern. Israel is doing okay. It's, we are at war. Like we said, we lost a lot of soldiers. It's painful. Uh, the, the rockets raining down on Israel, even though most of them are knocked out of the sky by the Iron Dome, still it traumatizes many Israelis. It's very difficult, but still, as far as the horrific uh, uh, ramifications for the people of Gaza, mm -hmm. that is my main concern, and my recommendation is that that would be the main concern of the world, which is why the international community must declare and impose a demilitarized Gaza. Because if you don't do that, we're going to be seeing the same images in a year from now. Not because Israel is bad, but because Israel, again, will be faced with a situation where we don't have a, cha don't have a choice. If Hamas regroups, rearms, and then decides again that, he, that it's going to rain down 2,000 rockets on Israel, Israel again will have to act, and again we will see these horrific images. Absolutely. And if it weren't for that Iron Dome shield, there's no question we would be seeing casualties on the Israeli side of upward, I think, of 3,000 people. And then maybe it would put into context what is at stake here in the region. Runa, i got to leave it there. Thanks so much for your insight. Thank you very much.